Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our journey into plant phenomics. Um, today I'm alone because Philip is very busy with the um, potato, with the harvesting time of potato, but he will be back next week. Um, so for who is new into, um, I have Um, so, sorry, I had like the YouTube open. Um, basically what I have, so uh, for who is new to our platform, I will shortly introduce who we are. Um, and then I'm gonna give Mitch the time to present you, introduce you into commercial learning for Leap and Fruit Shape. Um, so who we are, we are a platform of, so, Philip and I, we founded this, we had this idea in the last film you know, 2020, and we thought that it was to create a platform where beginners in plant, plant phenomena can meet experts. And especially we are like very interested in um, like uh, promoting open source tools for data analysis. And so for this reason, we started this platform and this workshop series. So if you are interested in joining us, we have a space. And to join us, you can just send an email at phenomforce um, at gmail.com. Uh, you can also visit our website, but also we have a Twitter account and you can follow us there since we share a lot of our um, events and news. So what is this workshop series? Um, so thanks to the support of the PPM and the Midwest Big Data App, um, we started this workshop series, which aim to introduce you to open source tools for data analysis, which we think is the most challenging part um, into in data uh, in phenomics. So we started last week with Philip introducing you into field in March R. Um, and today there is the second speaker. Um, we want to thank Noah Falgram because he supported us in building the in that environment where you guys are going to uh, you guys are going to join now. Uh, but we also want to thank Jennifer Clark and Christoph because they they are part of the TMPPM and they were the one promoting us with this work workshop series. Um, so before starting, I want to invite you to launch the binder. Um, so if you register to this workshop, you have to receive um, an email with the link. Um, if you click on that link, um, this page will open. And so at the bottom of the page, there is the bottom launch binder. So click on that and it can take some minutes, uh, but at the end you will have the R Studio open where you can type and follow the comments that Mitch uh, will introduce. Um, so the speaker of today is Mitchell Feldman. He just got his PhD at University of California, Davis, um, and today and now he is a radio genetics application leader in Pepper at HMH and Klaus. Um, today is going to talk about the application of machine learning for quantizing and quantifying fruit and leaf shape. Um, I guess it would be mostly on strawberry, but I think he can talk more about it. And I'm going to leave him to lead this workshop. Um, so, hi, Mitch. I'm gonna, Hello, everybody. Um, hi, so, everyone. I'm going to leave. Good luck. Uh, you, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, you can share your screen. So for just for I have to say that um, so Mitch will start with a short introduction where he's going to talk about the tool and his analysis and how it's journeying this machine learning application. Um, and then there will be the practical part of the workshop. So you can um, if you have any question, you can type them live on YouTube and then I will um, help uh, Mitch. To, I will ask Mitch to answer this question. Uh, so good luck and see you later. And Arita, do you know if they're able to see the shared screen?
Well, I hope that you can see my slides. Um, so hey, the Tracy, conversation are today. Are you muted or not? Oh no, I'm not muted. Because I cannot listen you. Um, no, I can you listen, Mitch? Can you hear me now? How about now? Um, talk now. Can you hear me? Yeah, now it's working. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay. Can you? Um, are you able to see my slides? Um, you have to share the screen. Yeah. Oh, I have to um, put. It, yeah, share the screen now, and I will yeah, add it on screen. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So, in a you know a conversation about technical details and this kind of thing, there's always some technical details that are missed. Um, but hey, now we're here. So I'm going to talk to you today about multivariate and latent approaches for fruit phenotyping in R. Almost all of the examples are going to come from a paper that was published in Giga Science this last year. Um, and so most of it is going to be strawberry focused. Um, but at the same time, really what we're talking about are the methodologies and sort of what led me to those methodologies. And you could apply those to any type of data set that's 2D um, and, and sort of looks like this. Um, so that'd be leaves, you could do pears or apples or pepper or tomato or sort of whatever you're interested in. Um, if you really look at the morphometric literature, a lot of it's focused in leaves. And I think that fruit are still becoming you know, we're not exactly sure what to do with them because they're 3D structures. And so we end up treating them like 2D objects, which is wrong. And so I think pushing for um, those 3D applications is really where we're sort of maybe stuck. Um, but that's that's fine. This was a really fun project to work on. Um, and so I, I like to lead this type of conversation with a single quote from Bruce Walsh. Um, as biologists, indeed, as scientists, we all live in flatland, trying to peer at highly complex problems from different perspectives to obtain some insight into their true nature. And so this is also, you know, uh, reflective of the allegory of the cave where there's some true variable source of information, a fruit, a leaf, a plant, whatever. And all we can do is look at it from some smaller dimension than what it actually exists in. So this is the paper that I was referring to. Um, the data set and the code are all on GitHub um, and on Zenodo, respective or in reverse logic. Um, and so the what's on binder is, I think there's 400 images um, due to file size. And so it's not the full data set, but of course you can go and grab the full thing off of Zenodo and, and work from there. And again, all the codes there, I'll be showing code examples um, and trying to talk about you know, what it means, what got me there. So yeah, this was a fun paper to work on. If you haven't read it, there's a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, I'm quite pleased with it. Of course, with any paper, the, you know, when I look at it now, the writing could improve. These are a couple of other papers that really, you know, inspired, I would say, my work um, in this field. And some of them started after and were published after I started, but others were, were not. Um, so this is a paper by Dan Shitwood, and if you're interested in morphometrics, you probably already know the breadth of morphometric literature that Dan has published. Um, I really like it. I think it's fun. I think it's exciting. Um, there's this work by Joe Gage and the Buckler Lab where they were looking at um, LIDAR data to look at plant structure and sort of whole plant architecture. And then this work from Jordan Ibbins, um, where they were looking at predicting or, or understanding the difference in time series data between a treated and untreated condition for, I think it's sorghum. Um, and so these concepts really are building this idea of latent phenotypes, where there's information in our highly high dimensional data, and we need to extract it. And by deciding what to extract a priori, um, we might be missing something. But by letting a machine decide, um, we may be able to capture more minute or smaller or maybe slightly less salient sources of information that are biologically relevant for prediction or understanding the classic dichotomy um, in, in science. 
Um, so these are a couple other papers, and I just like to point them out because, again, it's really important for me to, you know, science, my science and your science, everybody's science. We're not we're not doing this in a vacuum, um, and I think it's important to, you know, admit when you're standing on the shoulders of giants. And so I really respect these authors, and I really respect this work, and it's just a, a really fun space to be in. Why do we sh study shape? period. Um, you know, what's the rationale? And it can be kind of hard to justify. Um, but these things, at least in strawberry, they're directly impacting the harvestability and your ability to handle um, and pack the fruit. And this is going to be the same thing for tomatoes, peppers, or anything that's packed into a box. You know, the, the shape of that object determines how well you can pack it. Um, the other thing is that categorical variables may be preferred in breeding programs. Um, and so we want to be able to link the information in our images to something that a breeder or a agricultural scientist would understand and would want to use. Um, but for a lot of biology, continuous variables are preferred and they are better for quantitative genetic analyses um, and this kind of thing. So using geometric morphometrics can really help us understand quantitatively what this information is and what our data is, um, which is the whole point. Um, so here, you know, the objectives are really to save time and money, reduce error and fatigue using unsupervised machine learning to classify images. We're trying to quantify fruit shape from digital images using geometric morphometrics and multivariate statistical methods. And then we're trying to understand the relationship between these categories and the quantitative feature set. Um, using supervised machine learning. Um, so almost all of these analyses rely on the collection of image-based data, and images are inherently noisy. Um, and so processing and pre-processing um, is used as you know, a way to accentuate the biological phenomenon of interest or to make that phenomenon more salient. Um, so we're trying to reduce the types of signals and noise to only one thing that we're interested in and make that relevant information more noticeable in the image. So three things that I want to sort of cover is geometric calibration, um, which is not something that I was able to do in the work that I'm presenting, but it's, I think, critically important. And the more I think about it, the more critical it becomes. Um, and so my approach going forward has changed. And it includes basically these Aruco pattern checkerboards. Um, so this is work from Amy Tab, um, turning a digital camera or a DSLR camera into a scanner. And you can use this type of Aruco pattern to um, calibrate the space so that pixels and millimeters have a direct relationship again. Um, they don't have that because of radial distortion and these kinds of things. And so if you can correct for that, you have a better way to get an absolute measurement out of your image. So this is sort of an example of how this works. This is just a picture of a, a grape cluster. And you can kind of tell that the size of these two squares on opposite sides of the image are slightly different. And this picture is taken from a slight angle um, relative to flat. Um, so you're actually a little bit closer here and a little bit further away. Um, but when we put this through CAS, basically these squares are the same size again. And so you can see that there's some curvature to the outline of this that's being warped. And so, and the this side, the right side of this image is um, stretched relative to this left side. And that's because you needed to make one side smaller in order to make it basically match each other. Um, the other process that's really standard, and I'm not gonna really get into the detail of, of how I did this, because I, I think I did a really, not a well-informed job of this um, is segmentation. And so segmentation is basically removing all of the information that is irrelevant to the object that you're trying to study um, or allows you to us to remove um, any biological signal that might come from color or noise in the background of an image. Um, and there's a whole field of research dedicated to just this one topic. And so it's impossible to cover, for me at least, what's the best and what's the worst. Um, but it's important, and so there are you know free tools available with Plant CV, Open CV, ImageJ, and what have you. Um, and then normalization, and I have a picture on the next slide to sort of suggest what this means. And so it's really you know when we're talking about shape and, and form, 
shape is just one part of this multidimensional equation that is separate from size. So size and shape are not related. You could have a triangle that's equilateral and exactly the same shape, but you know, 10 times as large. And so you wanna describe the shape in a way that is invariant to those sizes. You can also then describe size as another part of this, this puzzle. And so really we're trying to you know, make sure that we're removing the effects that size might have on these analyses, because we don't wanna be studying size, we're studying shape. And so this is what I mean. Um, so all of these images of strawberries, and this is what the um, example data set looks like. There are 400 of these in, on Binder, and there are 6,874 on Zenodo. Um, but these all have the same, um, they maintain their aspect ratio, and they all are 1,000 by 1,000 pixel images. And so basically the maximum dimension, either uh, um, length or width, is, is standardized. So in something that would be a perfect square, the entire object would take up the frame and be a thousand by 1,000 square. In the case of a circle, you'd have um, the top of the circle and the bottom of the circle and both the sides touching the corners or the edges of the frame, um, but the corners and sort of the rounded parts not right at those extremum would be um, not in the frame. And so this way we have a relationship directly between each pixel. So each pixel has the same information or the same sort of meaning where the top left pixel has the same re relationship to the center of the image than the, the far right um, upper corner, or what have you. And then, so what I'm really gonna talk about today is describing um, these binary maps or these two dimensional black and white images of, of strawberries um, using lines, splines, points, and pixels. And so splines is sort of the classic one where we're taking this outline and doing elliptical Fourier analysis. Points, we're doing um, generalized procrustes. And then I had this idea to put these into a structural equation model as the observed variables to reconstruct some latent factor that exists. So this is the, the one example of a, of a factor model that I'll, that I'll demonstrate. And then the rest is, okay, we're doing PCA on basically pixel values or sums of pixel values. And it's pretty simple. Um, these are some summaries of, of line descriptors. This is gonna be on YouTube, so I'm not gonna um, go into too much detail. Outlines, again, you know, if we follow the closed outline, we have a sine function and a cosine function, depending on if you're talking about X or Y. So here we start at one, we go to the, the minimum, we come back up to the middle, we go to the, the maximum, and then we come back down. So one to minimum, up to the maximum, and back down to the center. Um, and same thing for this other object. And then we can do principal components on the coefficients of these cosine functions, these sine and cosine functions, and try to understand what is this doing to the shape of this object holistically. Landmarks, um, this is points again. So this is an example from one of Dan's papers where you, if you have a homology in your data set like with leaves, it's really simple. I mean, it's, it's very time consuming because you have to physically go in and register each one of these points. So the more homologous points you have, the longer it's probably gonna take you to register them all um, in all of your images. And then you're basically mapping the distance and the changing of the distances between these points. Um, and so with strawberry, instead of doing homology, um, I thought mathematical similarity was probably the closest I could get. So I decided to have a 50 evenly spaced points around the outline of the strawberry be my landmarks. Um, and so in this case, we can see the distribution, um, the bivariate distribution of each one of these points as they go around the object. And so I made this in PowerPoint. I don't have some fancy code to remake this figure, um, but I would like to see that if somebody uh, wants to do that. And so with this, you can visually see differences in the angle of variance. So here it seems to be always pointing towards the center of the object and same thing in this upper right corner where the variance seems to be um, not straight, not on either X or Y axis, but on a function of the two of them or on a composite of the two. So then the idea is, well, some of these are gonna be more variable than others. Some of them are, have contained more information related to shape than others, um, which we might be able to say is re reflected by the standard deviation 
of the principal components of each one of these landmarks. And what you actually see is that there is a, I've removed it here for, for time, but there's a cyclic sort of oscillation to the variability of these landmarks. And there's actually four peaks um, at the tip, which is comprised of these four points on the left-hand side and these four points on the right-hand side. There's the left side. So again, we're going around um, clockwise, starting from the, the center point. And so this is the, sort of the left-hand side, and then what's referred to as the neck, and then the right-hand side. And so the idea is, okay, can we describe the shared variance of these landmarks um, using a structural equation model? And so this is the structure of that model, and we'll do this in, in the example. Um, and so basically, we're trying to find some value, some latent value for a side, tip, the other side and the neck, and then use that information to try to say something about shape. Shape. Um, principal components, this basically follows one strategy. You have your bi binary map, you flatten that to a vector, and you stack all your vectors, and then you do principal components on them. It's that, it's that simple. Um, one of the challenges with this is um, there are many pixels, especially those in, on the edges and in the center that don't vary. So every the center of every image is a black pixel. So there's no variance there. And so depending on how you approach this, you could remove all that, you could remove those pixels, or you don't scale your PCs. And so most, or you don't scale the data going into your principal component analysis. And I would say that the sort of consensus, it's not 100%. Um, but is it's better to scale than not to scale. Um, but we won't be doing that because of, again, the approach that I decided to take. But from these, we can reconstitute images. So we can say, OK, here's our mean shape in all these pixel space, in this entire pixel space. And what if we add 1.5 times the standard deviation of principal component 1 to this? Well, we get this really blocky looking strawberry. And if we subtract that same thing, we get a more um, elongated strawberry. And so this is actually reflective of what this first principal component is doing, where it's really mapping to the aspect ratio. So the ratio of the length, length to width. Um, so again, an aspect ratio of one, you have the same width as height. And an aspect ratio of two, you are um, taller, two times taller than you are wide, or longer than you are wide. Um, this gives us a whole bunch of variables to deal with. Yeah, how do we do that? The idea is to find some categorical representation of these images that we can then uh, use as a target for a supervised machine learning for either um, feature extraction and importance and this kind of thing and prediction, just understanding you know, what, what quantitative features are going to be the most valuable for us. And so I ended up developing this um, simple program called the principal progression of K clusters. And the idea is if you have uh, K means clustering um, from this data or other data like it, and you don't know what the absolute best uh, number of clusters is, you do a bunch of them. And you can use that shared information to line these things up in a row. Um, and so here's an example from K means, just the output where we have cluster one, two, three, four, and five going from left to right. Um, but you can see that there is probably some order to which that these should be uh, uh, lined up on. And so using the principal progression of K clusters or PPKC, you have a uh, order that ends up looking like this. And so this actually makes sense. And the nice thing is, is that it matches what people have said in strawberry literature when, when using shape as an ordinal trait. Um, so not only does this map to what people are using um, in biology or in, in breeding programs, um, at least some of them, um, it's also, we also have a bunch of metrics. So we can determine what the optimal fit is or if we're overfit, so we can figure out how many clusters do we actually have in our data. Um, so again, we have machines, we have information, this is good. Um, this is an example from random forest uh, regression to select features. Um, so 
the conclusions basically here are PPKC provides a simple method to properly order clusters. Quantitative fruit shape descriptions um, allow us to predict these fruit classifications so they make sense in a way that is um, relatable to humans. And fruit shape can be manipulated through selection practices to reduce waste and potentially improve consumer enjoyment, which again, that last one is a bit hand wavy. Do consumers really shop based on the shape? They definitely shop based on appearance. When you have a strawberry, you can't taste them. A lot of the times you can't even smell them. Um, so you are really looking at it. And so if you see things with deformities, people don't want it. But if you have a bunch of highly uniform shapes, I don't know if there's a preferred sort of ideal shape. Okay. And so now we'll get into sort of the meat of this. This entire thing relies uh, mostly, primarily, I should say, on, on two R packages, um, Momox and Levon. Uh, Momox for elliptical Fourier analysis and um, generalized procrustes analysis, and then Levon for the structural equation model part. The rest of what I'm going to show you is all in base R. So it's just using PR comp for principal components, and that's it. That's it. Um, and if you can't tell from listening to me, I'm, I have a sort of informal tone. And so this reads sort of the way that I would talk about these things. Um, it's not a very formal tutorial, but this is linked on my GitHub. Um, and so I have this confession here, which is basically what I already said in the um, when I was talking about segmentation. I chose a very brute force approach to this. I used the simple interactive object extractor on image in ImageJ or in Fiji. It's super simple to get working, um, but it's very it's not very flexible. Basically, it learns a segmentation pattern based on a single image and then applies that to everything else. And so there are a lot of instances where there were mistakes in the segmentation and I had to go back and redo them. Um, and so I still don't have, because I haven't spent too much time trying to, um, I still don't have sort of the perfect um, <laughs> segmentation algorithm for this data. Um, but again, what I've provided is already segmented and, and ready to work on. Um, and again, if I were to do this again, um, I would use an Aruco backdrop so I could calibrate all of this information together so that the geometry um, is reflective of the real world instead of the, the camera world. Um, I might include a color checker. Um, I have hesitations about color calibration and, and this kind of thing, um, but that's neither here nor there. Okay. So the analyses, there I think are seven of them in total uh, that we're gonna go through. And the first one is elliptical Fourier analysis. Basically, once you figure out how to do this in R, it's a couple lines of code and then you're done. And it's the simplest to understand, I think. There are really nice visual representations um, that make it easy to understand. So this data set that I'm loading, um, I'm loading it in from list files, and I see that I have missed a chunk of code where the text wraps off the screen. But basically, this is pointed at the directory where the images are, uh, the binary images are stored, and then it just lists them all, um, which is really easy. Um, we're going to take this and we're going to put it into a function called import JPG. So, again, as I was saying earlier, there's nearly 7,000 images in this data set. And a lot of the analyses don't happen immediately when you have uh, large data sets, or this isn't even that massive, but um, it's big enough to slow some things down on your local computer. Um, and these are rep uh, three replicates of 574 genotypes in Salinas, California um, in 2018. Okay. Um, this chunk of code next is really, really nasty. And the reason this chunk of code is really, really nasty is because my segmentation algorithm or my segmentation approach was sloppy and brute forcey. Um, so not everything is as, as crisp and as clean as I would like it to be. Um, so basically, there is a bunch of images. There's uh, 23, 24, because I index at zero for some reason. There are 24 images where 
import underscore JPG fails to load the image. And so I spent a long time trying to figure out what was going on because the images exist. They're there. They're the same size. They have all of the same information as any other image in this data set, but they just weren't loading properly. And so what I found out was it's the outline. The outline isn't clean. There are instances where you have these single pixel tendrils sort of emanating from the, the larger object. And these are causing problems for this. So if you have a really, really noisy segmentation and you're using JPEGs, which are, are lossy anyways, you're probably gonna run into the same thing too. And so one of the strategies that I've started to take uh, with new data and, and so on um, is to open these images before uh, running this kind of thing. So um, opening an image is this like weird morphological sort of verb, um, but basically it means that you are deleting pixels from the object around the boundaries and then you're putting that same number of pixels back. And so small artifacts, small lines, and single pixel wide things are gonna be lost because you're removing them and then you're basically blowing it up like a balloon again, but it doesn't know that there was this weird tendril thing. And so you still end up with a very similar shape or you could, it's basically like doing the convex hull in some ways, um, but um, maybe a little bit better for, um, maintaining some curvature. Um, and so that's something that I would do. And so going forward, and so this approach, you know, it, basically it was every time I, it, it stopped working, I would remove the image, which from, from this larger sort of um, import, and then would put it in here and import it one at a time. And then I would appended them all together. And this like it, it looking at it it's really sloppy and i'm not super proud of it but that's what i did um, um so again if a, i had there is a question actually okay perfect uh, let's see this guy um he has to appear here um okay so i will read it and then when it appears i will so oh here he is um so he's asking, why didn't load a directory where all the images were stored? As of now, there are 23 images and manual importing was pretty easy. What if someone had to import, let's say, a thousand images? Mm -hmm. So this is importing um, all from the same directory. And there are 6,800, so there are 6,874 images in this space in LF, which is this file that is the directory of all these images. And so 23 out of those 6,874 um, have these weird artifacts on their edges. And so we're not able to, wasn't able to load them um, all at the same time. It just sort of crashed import JPG for some reason. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, so again, if these had been segmented better or if I had opened them prior to doing any of these analyses, this would have looked like this nice little one-liner um, where we're importing the JPEG using the, the list of the files, LF, that's for some reason what I called it. Um, and then we're turning this into an out object. An out object is basically an outline. And so Momox is taking your image and finding the outline. And so when it's black and white, it's really easy to find the outline. Um, <laughs> yep. Um, so now that we have this outline object, this is the hardest part of doing elliptical FOIA analysis in R, is literally getting your data in. And if you, have, if you don't have the same problems that I had because your segmentation or your, your plan is better than what I did, um, it's, a, it's just one line of code. And then you can start exploring these data um, in a way that's interesting. So this function, cool oscillo, it's sort of like you know plotting an oscilloscope, um, which is a electrical frequency thing um, of our elliptical FOIA analysis. And so we'll zip down here to some pictures, and I have I think four of these um, just to show what different fruit look like and what the sine cosine looks like, 
Um, the really nice thing about strawberries is that they're basically ellipsoidal to begin with. So there's not a whole lot of variability from an ellipse except for things that are effectively noise in your outline. Um, so this object uh, decomposes into these two functions. Um, I don't know why it prints that, but it does in our markdown. Um, this object is kind of funny um, because it still had the, the stem on it. And you can start to see like right around here, right between eight and nine, um, what I was talking about with these sort of weird artifacts on your in your image, you can see that there's some inclusion of the shape in the outline for whatever reason. So this is like, it's noise and it's false complexity in, in your shape. And we can see that the stem does actually impact the, the cosine uh, or the, the y-axis uh, portion of this, where we have this nice little peak here, and we have a sort of a um, a trough, I guess, or just a, a level right there. A couple more images. Um, and again, these have these, these noise. And again, the part of the nice thing about elliptical FOIA analysis is by fitting a function through this data, you're smoothing. So you're smoothing the outline, um, which is great. And this is the last one. And so there are a couple berries in here that look like this. Um, so in my, in my data set, I oriented everything the same direction. So the stem was pointed in the same direction. So right here, you can see this little hump around six, and this actually points straight up in the image towards the top of the, the screen, I guess, or towards the top of the camera. And so this would have been next to a, shape that looked like this, where again, the stem up here between six and seven um, is also pointing straight up. So this is actually a very deformed strawberry. And you can see some, basically there's this, uh, in strawberries, there's this thing called monkey facing, which is when a bunch of the achenes or the seeds on the outside of the receptacle are not pollinated. And so they never emit hormones to get that tissue to grow. And so you get some weird shape artifacts. Chances are this is linked to damage and not linked to um, a genetic predisposition to this kind of deformity. And so if I were to go and do this again, my sampling strategy would change where I'd be avoiding this kind of shape and maybe notating or noting that these existed in that plot, but not actually looking at them in terms of this analysis, because this is not a reflection of the genotype. This is a reflection of, you know, external damage. But if you sample enough, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day anyways. Um, so with that, I do want to point out how important sampling is. And as you're getting into this type of space, really think about how am I doing this? Make sure it's as systematic as possible, right? Because if your images are bad, it, there's no way to recover um, or to make that information really high quality once you already have lost the quality of the, the image. So if you have very, very noisy images um, or your images don't, have any reflection of the uh, phenomenon that you're interested in, no approach is going to help you to find that if, that, if that makes sense. So really standardize things if you can um, is, my, is my only suggestion. Um, Ptolemy is very similar to what we just looked at. It basically shows you how, um, how close of a fit the different ellipse with the different harmonic levels of elliptical FOIA analysis are to your strawberry. And so, again, I'm doing harmonics one through five. Um, as we'll see, this is actually too many. Um, but the idea was, you know, kind of oversaturate and then and then filter later. And so, going from yellow to, I guess that's like blood red, wine red. Um, and this, you can see that this starts out as a really nice sort of ellipse, this yellow one. And then you start to get this bending and stretching so that it gets closer and closer to the outline. Um, it's not perfect. And it probably never will be unless you really oversaturate with way too many harmonics. But then, you know, something like this, where there's this curvature, is that part of the shape? Is that something that you really want to capture? If you do want to capture that, then you need to do more than, than what I was doing here. And again, it's sort of a challenge with these, with stems. You're trying to map to that but you're never going to um, hit it perfectly unless you have way too many harmonics. And 
I should say that it's important, or at least to me, it, it felt important to use the same number of harmonic levels as uh, for each image, right? And so I didn't try to make decisions about, you know, maybe this one I'll fit with six, maybe this one I'll fit with four or three because it's more simple or whatever. Everything got the same treatment. So objects that are like this are going to have more error um, in their reconstructions. Um, objects like this, though, are going to be really nice. Um, and you can see that around here, around the tip, there is some deviation. But almost everywhere else on the red line, um, the blood red line, you're very, very close um, to the shape of this object. And actually, the ellipse, this first harmonic ellipse, is also pretty darn close, um, I would say. Is it? appropriate to describe a fruit with just an ellipse? Maybe not, but if that's what you wanted to do, you could do that. Um, and then this is that weird shape again. And so these are just weird. Um, I called them elf shoes because of the way that they looked when I was holding them in, in real life. But here they sort of just don't look like elf shoes, which is sad. Um, so there are a couple other. Oh, that's a typo, but that's OK. There are a couple other functions that I show here just to sort of look at, and you're you know, more than welcome to explore those um, in detail. This one basically shows you how far away from any one point on the outline are you with your different harmonic levels. And so as you add harmonics, the deviation um, gets much smaller. But there's still points along the outline. And interestingly enough, these correspond to the tip over here and the neck, which we'll get into later, and we already talked about a little bit. Um, so the most variable, variable parts of the shape are also the parts where there's the most error in your reconstruction um, using uh, elliptical Fourier analysis or EFA. Um, calibrate reconstructions is another nice figure. So you can basically see, like, OK, how well am I doing? Um, if, if it's really your objective to reconstruct these and you want to be perfect, how many um, how many harmonics do you need? So the ellipse, the ellipse plus the second uh, harmonic, third, fourth, fifth. Um, this one is not very different than four. Um, and you could argue that four is not super different than three. Some more typos. Cool. Um, so this is, again, the challenge with this is, is really the getting the data in. After that, it's just a series of functions that are built into Momox. And they're fairly easy to run that really enable you to intuit and interpret what this analysis is doing. And so that was sort of the context there. Um, you could also read papers, and that will help you get sort of an intuition of what's going on and, and help you understand what you want to do and what you need to do. So it turns out that in this analysis, there are four harmonics that are needed. Um, again, I ended up doing five and discarding the fifth one at the end. Um, Anyways, so this is the function for doing this, um, for doing this analysis in R using Momox. It's just e foyer. Um, you give it the outline object, and which in this case is called straw, S-T-R-W, um, the number of harmonics, whether or not you want to normalize the coefficients. And then the, uh, I can't remember what start equals false does. Um, but you can look that up in the help manual if you're really interested. Um, from this, you can also uh, get a mean shape. And so it's kind of important because you want to be able to know what deviations are affecting your average shape. So you fit the mean, and then you say, OK, how is this impacting everything? Or how are these uh, harmonics impacting that shape? And so in this case, we're drawing the mean from 500 points. The next thing is really, you know, okay, what is each one of these harmonic levels doing? We've already seen sort of how they summed together affect the ability to reconstruct. Um, but here again, this is built into Moox, which is really nice. It just does it for you. Um, this is a amplification factor plot, and so basically on the x-axis you have one, two, three, four, five harmonics, and then you have an amplification factor. So how much larger was the relative proportion? Uh, a relative scaling of that harmonic in the shape that you're observing. So if we take harmonic one, which again is this ellipse, and we completely remove it from the reconstruction, we get this weird manifold um, of a shape, which is obviously not biologically relevant. Um, but you would also never look at um, 
uh, you never try to reconstruct a shape without having that first initial ellipse. I mean, that's one of the most important parts of all of these. Um, and then if you remove um, the second, third, fourth, and fifth, you can see in this top line that basically removing one at a time, you have more of a, an ellipse. You have sort of a pretty close to the mean shape um, in the, the last three, which is basically saying that those final three harmonics aren't actually impacting your ability to reconstruct the shape that much. And we've already talked about that, so I'm not going to spend any more time um, going over that. But the next thing we do now that we have these um, harmonic, this harmonic information, and so each harmonic comes with four coefficients, a function for sine and a function for the cosine, so basically the x and the y um, component. And we're going to do principal components on them. Um, and we can argue if, if anybody wants to. I don't really want to argue. Um, but principal components is unsupervised machine learning to me. Um, it fits into that ballpark of, of stuff that you're doing. You can use it for clustering. You can use it for um, summarizing information. So it kind of works like an autoencoder, but with a different set of assumptions. And it's just really easy to implement. So cool. Um, so here we have basically our principal component analysis. This one is built into Momox, so I, I just used it there because it knows how to handle all of their data, but you could put that data in the um, uh, PR comp or some other principal component tool in R if you want to, or you could extract it to you know, Python or, or whatever you want. Okay, so we have our principal component analysis completed um, using PCA. And the next thing is to look at, you know, what does this do to our shape? How does this impact our shape? Um, apparently, mutate is deprecated. Okay, so here are our our shapes in the principal component space. So we can see that the center column is just the mean shape for all of these, and then going to the left, we're removing some standard deviation, or we're heading towards the negative direction, negative standard deviation of principal component one, and the opposite in the positive direction going to the right for principal component one. And so we can see, I mean, this is a pretty weird shape, but there aren't really objects that are five standard deviations away from the mean shape in this data set. It's not that convoluted of a data set. 2.5, sure, but five is too much. So really the idea here was to see how what in an extreme way, how is this impacting shape? And so you can use this to figure out, okay, you know, what do these mean? Is there, you know, any biologically uh, relevant information in these, or is it just sort of noise, something that I'm not actually that interested in? And in this case, it's something that we're interested in. Um, as we talked about earlier in, in the presentation, um, our first principal component seems to be mapping to you know, some type of lob lobedness, but also to the aspect ratio. So we have these um, longer, thinner on the, on the left and wider and shorter on the right. Okay. Um, so this is a really I spent probably too much time going over this one thing, but the idea here is pretty straightforward. Um, you have an outline. You can fit a series of uh, sine and cosine functions to either the x or y axis, or both in this case. You take those coefficients from those functions, you do principal components on them, and that's it. Um, so then you can you know, do all of the principal component things that you would normally do. You can look at a scree plot. How many of these principal components do I need to explain X proportion of the phenotypic variance um, or the observed variance, you can, I mean, I, I think that that's probably the one. And then you can do quantitative genetic analyses on this, or you can do um, make nice figures or, or whatever you want. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, I'm not going to show any quantitative genetic analyses here. Um, if you're interested in that, though, feel free to reach out to me by email or on Twitter, and we can certainly talk about quantitative genetic analyses in this multivariate space. Okay, so I'm gonna spend some time um, on this next one. It starts out pretty simple, but it gets convoluted pretty quickly. 
Um, and it, it comes from this conversation that we were having earlier, um, where one, if you want to do principle or, uh, sorry, if you want to do generalized progressives analysis on a strawberry, you have to make a lot of decisions um, because there aren't a lot of homologous landmarks. In fact, I would argue that there's only one uh, easily identifiable homologous landmark, which is where is the stem? So the stem end is the one homology, but that's not nearly enough to do any kind of complex analysis. Um, so with this, it was, okay, let's do saturating, quote unquote, landmarks around the outline. Um, so I ended up doing 50. I don't know why I chose to do 50. Um, when I looked at the, the number of points that it provided um, and on a shape, it seemed reasonable. And so I just sort of went with that. And I'm not upset that I did that. So we're using that same coup object from earlier, actually. So we only loaded the data once for elliptical Fourier analysis, and we're using that same input for generalized progressives analysis. But in this case, I have this for loop here. And again, I tend to think in for loops, so um, I apologize for nested for loops being everywhere. Um, but this function basically extracts 50 evenly spaced landmarks or points from the outline of, of these images. And then we turn that into a landmark object. And that's all it is. That's all it takes to get there, um, which is pretty great. This next part is not pretty great. It kind of was a waste of time and energy, um, but I thought that I was being really uh, creative and really cute. And I started thinking about like, okay, I have all of these landmarks. I have 50 of them. Each landmark has two dimensions to it. Um, and if I'm thinking about these landmarks, I wanna be able to say something about its position in both the X and Y coordinate space. And I was just really, really confused about what to do. And the first thing for some reason that came to my head was like, oh, let's um, think about this as dis distance and displacement. So let's think about this, how far away from a center is it? And what's the angle of displacement from that center? Because we can use that to summarize exactly where in space it is, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense you know, when I think about it now. Um, but that's what this is. Basically, we have this um, X and Y information. So they're centered on each landmark has a, a center of mass. And then the distribution of all these other points in that space are the difference from that. So we have distance and displacement. So we have the square root of the X minus mean X squared plus Y minus mean Y squared. And then the displacement is the arc, or yeah, I guess the arctan of, of those things. So that's the angle between um, horizontal and um, this X, Y point from the mean. Um, and so then it was like, oh, cool. You know, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna do this a bunch of times and then I'm going to make these complex numbers because all of a sudden I'm just like, oh yeah, that's a single value. A complex number is one thing. It's not, you know, you have the real part and you have the imaginary part. And so you're back to a bivariate system. And it turns out that going through this approach, um, which again, I just didn't see because I didn't really know enough, you know, about what I was doing to, to see that initially. Um, it turns out that you just get back to the X and Y coordinates of each landmark. So it was a complete waste of time. Um, but I'm showing you this really as an example of, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do. They're really not that hard to um, implement and to demonstrate and to show. But if you don't really think about what you're doing first, it's really, really easy to run yourself in circles. Um, and so avoid running in circles, but don't avoid, you know, being creative and trying new things. So here we have now this data that's real and imaginary um, components of this distance and displacement information from each landmark. And again, this is literally the X and Y coordinate if the coordinate system is defined as being centered in the mean of each landmark one at a time. So what to do now? We're back to where we started. Um, 
so my approach then was take each one of these bivariate systems. Again, there are 50 because there are 50 landmarks. And so you have an X and Y position around each landmark that's centered on zero. And we're going to do principal components on them because why wouldn't you? And so this that's what this chunk is doing. So we're basically making a data frame or a matrix that is the dimensions, the dimensionality that we need. And then we're doing principal components on the real and imaginary part of each landmark. There are 50 landmarks, so you're doing this 50 times. From this, we're extracting the, the angle that this is uh, this matrix is rotating, that this transformation is rotating. The nice thing about doing the, the PCA in a two-dimensional system is you have one transformation option. It's just to rotate it until um, you have the most variance on principal component one and the second most variance on principal component two. And we're also extracting the variance on each one of these uh, two axes. So that's fine and dandy. Um, but now we have 50 principal component ones and we have 50 principal component twos. Oh, you know, where are we going with this? Um, my whole idea was let's look at where is the variability and let's try to use that information to make decisions about, you know, what to use, what, what information is actually gonna be relevant. And so when we do this, this is the plot that I had showed earlier with the bottom portion cut out. Um, when we do this, we actually get, we see this really nice and, and kind of interesting pattern emerge, which is this very, very periodic um, function of, of variability on these outlines. So you have way more variance, um, on the, at the tip, again, it goes from the tip starting at the bottom um, clockwise to the neck in the center, and then back down uh, going clockwise to the tip again. So on the edges of this plot, you have the data points or the landmarks that are on the tip or at the tip. So we have four peaks. And so my approach basically was like, okay, what's the median of this? Since a lot of them are down here and maybe these are outliers or whatever. What's the median of this? We're going to throw away everything that's not greater than the median uh, uh, variance. Is that the right approach? Could we have just used all 50? Certainly, but I was looking for a way to really um, separate and categorize where these points were, were coming from. And so we can do that with the principal component two as well. And what we see is something similar, except sort of in the opposite direction where we have reduced variance, not globally reduced variance, but reduced variance around the tip. This dual spike in the middle, which is pretty interesting to me, but it's basically saying that the, all the variance in this axis is, is taken up by principal component one, and there's basically none left in principal component two. And then around that, you, you get back to some variability because the angle of the variance is changing depending on where you are on the outline of the object. And so to understand this and to think about this a little bit more, I suggest going back um, after this is over to the beginning of this and looking at the strawberry plot or going to the paper and looking at the figure um, where I'm showing sort of 16 of these 50 and trying to get an interpretation for, okay, where is the, the most spread in all of these points? And it's kind of a, a nasty figure to look at because each each plot has 6,874 um, points in it. So it's kind of annoying to look at and to look at in high resolution, but that's what the internet is for, I guess. Um, the last thing that we're gonna look at is really, you know, again, coming back to understanding the angle of rotation. So the angle of rotation is, if I have my original space, um, X and Y. And so again, if I'm transforming this into principal components, the only transformation I have available to me is a rotation about um, the, the origin. And so if we look at theta, this is an angle. And so the, at first we are right at 90 degrees, um, which is 90 degrees from horizontal, which, oops, uh-oh, um, which, it, there we go, which is vertical. And so, as I was saying at the at the beginning, almost all of the variance at the tip is towards the center of the object, which is directly straight up. So it's vertical. 
And so as we move around this, so as we move around these points from one to 50 going left to right, we shift from 90 up to about 180. And then on either side of these, because if you imagine um, um, zero and 180 being the same kind of thing, because one is your rotation is flipped 180 degrees and one is flipped zero degrees. So they're both basically horizontal or perpendicular or parallel to the horizontal axis, the original horizontal axis. Um, so we go up to this 180. So now we're right now we're at the side, the left-hand side, and it's going straight towards the center of the object on that, that axis. And we drop down here. Now we're at zero, which is exactly the same as 180, as I already said. And then we come back up into 90. And so we're at the neck right now. And almost all of our variance is directly perpendicular to the horizontal axis in our original um, data set. And you can follow this around. So basically, it predicts exactly what we had seen, where the variability is always pointed towards the center of the object, which isn't too surprising. Um, you wouldn't expect one of these to be on the side. And most of the variance is up and down. That basically means that your your landmark is not the same. It's not re representing the same point um, along the strawberry. Um, at least that's how I interpreted it. It probably could be interpreted in several other ways as well. OK, so as I say here, strawberry form and the variance of landmarks on that form is cyclic. Wow. Um, so. Uh, yes. So this next part, I can't believe I didn't put a, a header here. Um, this next part is how I tried to make sense of, of this data and how I tried to make sense of this. And so it's a rabbit hole. You, you jump in, you don't know how far down it's going to go until you hit the bottom. And the bottom that I hit was, I feel, is pretty exciting. I hadn't seen this before in morphometric literature. I don't know if it's uh, super important or super informative, but I'm still kind of excited about it. You know, pat myself on the back. Um, the idea being um, that all of these landmarks that we've just identified come from the same object. So all these landmarks are observations of the shape of a single object or uh, for every object. And so they share some source of covariance. You know, they, they vary and they covary, these landmarks, and that the way that they covary is shared, or at least some of it is. And so this is sort of perfect for a structural equation model or confirmatory factor analysis or something like this. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take these landmarks, the ones that we've already determined to be the most variable ones at these four different regions, and we're going to construct a structural equation model that defines shape as being manifest from these landmark observations. So before we do that, we're going to take our principal components, our, I think there's 25 of them or so. Uh, I think it's actually 25. Um, and we're going to do principal components on those principal components, because why not, just to see, OK, where's the variability uh, in this space? And does it make sense, or is it just completely, just completely random? And it turns out you get a figure that looks something like this. And the amazing thing about this figure to me is these points down here are the points associated with the tip of the strawberry. So principal component one is associated with the variance, primarily associated with the variability at the tip or near the tip. These happen to be the left-hand side. These happen to be the points around the neck. And these happen to be the points around the right-hand side. So we actually can see these clusters arise in this principal component space of, of, these informa of this information. So we have this anti-correlation, this negative correlation between um, the neck and the tip, which is not too surprising. And we have this negative correlation between, um, or this, this anti-relationship between the left-hand side and the right-hand side, which also isn't too surprising. Um, and then there's correlation, of course, between 
points on the tip and between points on the left-hand side as you'd expect, because they're not separated by such a great physical distance that it's like, oh my God, they're completely independent. And actually what we're showing here is that they aren't independent and they're clustered. Um, so I didn't introduce Levon, um, but Levon is a an R package for structural equation models. Um, it's constantly being updated and, and uh, actively maintained, I guess is what I should say. Um, and I learned about structural equation models, and I'm not an expert, far from it, um, from my partner who had introduced them to me because she was going to take a class. And I ended up taking the same class. Um, it was a structural equation model course by Micah Ramtula at UC Davis in the psychology department. And this class absolutely blew my mind um, because I still have no idea what the hell is going on. Um, but I can pretend like I do. I, I know how to understand and evaluate the metrics of, of goodness of fit and this kind of thing. And so I rely pretty heavily on, on that. Um, but this is the what this code looks like to really um, to state, to make this model statement. So we'll walk through a little bit of it, but we'll not get too down in the weeds because in reality, um, I don't know if anybody's ever gonna do this and take this approach again, uh, including myself. I just have no idea. Um, basically what this says is tip is a latent, a latent variable, a unobserved um, latent variable. We didn't measure tip. We measured um, these landmarks that are associated with tip. And the shared covariance of variable 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 48, 49, and 50, because remember, as it comes around, you're back at the tip. The observations in the shared covariance of these observed variables gives rise to the variable tip. And the same thing for the left-hand side, but with a different uh, set of, of values, a different set of variables, neck and side and the right-hand side. So they all have a structure that is determined by the value of these ob observed landmarks. It's pretty convoluted. Um, the last thing that we do is we just uh, set a new latent variable. So this is a basically a four latent variables in the second layer. So all of our observed variables are below here. They all link to a latent variable. And then those latent variables link to a single latent variable. The idea being that there is one construct, there is one variable, one thing that is shape. And from these observations of 25 landmarks, we can say something about shape through the shared covariance of all these landmarks. This, this part down here is basically saying um, that the variance of tip, I set it equal to one. I'm not super concerned about um, the actual variability as long as the covariance is 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 the same, you know. So the magnitude of the variance doesn't matter. Um, it's really the information therein. And so I just had something and it completely went. Um, but we're just going to move on. So if it, if there are any questions, again, just ping in. It, it maybe it'll help jar my memory. Um, but this is how we fit this function. This is how we fit this uh, this model um, using Levon. Uh, so this is their structural equation model uh, function. I'm giving it my shape model, which is this whole thing right here. Oh, right. What I was going to say is if you have too many parameters to fit in your model and not enough data, um, you have to set some of them equal to something. So you have to force some of them to have a value. And so by setting these to equal to one, I'm not going to be worried about um, having too little data to actually uh, estimate those parameters. And so that was the point of setting those equal to one. Um, I wasn't really in a, in a place where that, that mattered too much, but I wanted to do that anyways, just to make things sort of smooth and make sense. So again, back here, we're in the structural equation model function from Levon. We give it our model that we've already specified. We give it our data. We tell it to standardize um, the latent variables. And we use a, I can't remember what DAWLS estimator is, um, but that's the one that I chose to use. It seemed um, to give the most stable response to this kind of thing. 
Um, the nice thing about Levon too is you don't even have to have the raw data. You can just, if you have just a covariance matrix, that's all it needs because it doesn't actually care what the value is. It cares what the covariance is. So it's asking the question, does my real data reflect the covariance that we sort of expect? Which is, again, it's still this mind blowing thing to me that I just have almost no idea how to talk about in a really educated way. Um, but we can estimate goodness of fit using the chi-squared uh, test. We can be using different types of things from here, um, which is cool. Um, it's really important to not just rely on one metric um, over others um, or just one and not the others, um, especially in the case of the chi-squared degrees of freedom test. The more degrees of freedom that you have, in this case, it's the difference between the number of parameters and the number of uh, unique cells in your covariance matrix. You have way too much statistical power to detect small differences between um, the fit of your model and how the model could fit, basically, which is kind of this, again, this weird thing. And so I usually don't rely on that, but it's important to re report it. Um, so this chi, chi squared degree of freedom test has 271 degrees of freedom, and the p value is 0, 0.00, meaning that this doesn't fit, you know, these, um, this model doesn't necessarily fit um, as well in this space. But again, there's just, we have way too much power to detect those minor differences. Um, I see that it didn't print out the, um, the other um, metrics that I was using. Um, but these are like CMI, TMI, um, different kinds of is that the one? I think it's TMI. These these are basically goodness of fit metrics that are commonly reported. And so there's functionality in Levon to report those metrics so you can evaluate them. And there's also quite a bit of literature out there where they try to standardize the amount of um, information and the way that you evaluate these models and the way that you evaluate goodness of fit. Um, because it's a really convoluted set of mathematics um, and it's really easy to do something because you feel like it. Um, so actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back up because I think that lands on an important topic. Um, this model, I didn't try to change it at all. I had decided that this is the structure um, that this data has. This is the underlying structure um, to this model. And I don't care if it's, this is the best fit or the, the worst fit. This is the thing that I'm saying is, is my model. So I could have gone through here, removed a bunch of variables, removed a bunch of parameters in a very um, exploratory kind of way and landed on a model that was better fit um, and maybe excluded you know, five or 10 or 12 of these variables. But that's not really what I wanted to show. In my case, I'm imposing this structure. This is what I want it to be and I'm gonna evaluate. And if the goodness of fit is good enough, cool. If it's awful, then I'm going to give up on this. And in this case, um, it happened to not be terrible. It was actually all the metrics except for the chi-squared degrees of freedom test were fine. Um, and by fine, I, I mean good enough. So there's a lot of information in this output. Um, you have basically the regression coefficient or the correlation between all of the variables that are constituting your latent variable. Um, and you have the correlation between um, all of your latent variables and the shape latent variable. Um, so moving on past this. And so we can inspect the, um, the covariance um, from our sample. Um, that's all fine and dandy. Um, the point of that, again, is not to necessarily evaluate those matrices because they're quite large and it's kind of hard to look at these. Um, but the point is, are there are there specific variables that don't fit more than others? And in this case, and so where I'm evaluating the um, the squared co the residual, the squared residual. And so this is basically telling us that variables forty eight and forty nine are problematic with several other variables. 
um, in this, but they don't belong to the same, um, they're not part of the manifestation of a specific latent variable. So say tip, um, 48 and 49 are both associated with tip and 15 is associated with the left-hand side. And so I'm not too concerned about this. And again, most of these are, are quite fine. So it's really this upper corner that's a little bit problematic. But um, again, the fit metrics that I evaluated, you can see those in the paper and get them from um, actually running this code. And I can't remember exactly what the function is to get all that out, but it's in the help manual for Levon. Apparently I plotted a histogram. Um, and so we can see that the vast majority of these have very little error. And then there's only a couple that have any sort of error. Um, more summary stuff from Levon. There's just a ton of stuff in structural equation models that is shrouded in mystery to me. And so trying to evaluate every single one felt very important to me um, at the time. But now it's just like, OK, maybe maybe this is too many pages of just text output. Um, OK, so this is the, the last part of, of this section. And so for some reason, I called this data frame table. Um, but LAV predict, or LAV, LAVON predict, um, is basically taking your, your, your model that you gave it and it's predicting values um, for those latent variables. And so in this case, it's tip, the side, the neck, and the other side, and shape. And so we can plot this with pairs, or you can plot this with you know whatever kind of thing you want to look at. Um, for ease and just simplicity, it shows pairs. And so we can see that you know there are these are all correlated variables. You know they're all correlated traits, but that's sort of what we expect them to be. We expect um, you know, in the case of shape, we expect it to be correlated um, with side, neck, side L, and tip. Um, and we already know that the variables themselves that gave rise to tip, side L, neck, and side R are correlated. We saw that in the PC uh, plot that we looked at earlier with the, the 50 points on it, or the, I guess it was the 25 points on it. So we know that there's a large amount of, of relationship with all these data. So this isn't too surprising. Um, but the point is, that the variable shape here is a single quantitative variable that you could do quantitative genetic, popula or not really population genetic, quantitative genetic, or um, any kind of analysis on that you wanted to, whether it be prediction for prediction or biology. Um, and same thing for the neck side and tip. You could effectively you know, try to manipulate just the, the tip of the strawberry without manipulating something else. Um, Again, they're correlated, so the success of that's probably going to be pretty low, but this is, who knows. Um, so there's a, in the R markdown file that I provided um, on GitHub, there is a function to create a structure from these fit models um, called ggsem, and I found this online and I modified it so that it would uh, look a bit, a little bit nicer. Um, however, it doesn't really look all that nice because everything gets printed right on top of each other. Um, but this again is the structure of this model. Um, so we have the four latent variables and then shape. All of these are uh, manifest by their series of, of observed landmarks. Um, yeah, and so, I'm not exactly sure if this is going to pan out in terms of utility outside of this single paper, um, but I can tell you that these traits are heritable, or these these values are heritable, um, and they can be predicted um, using genetic information, um, not perfectly, but pretty well. So they fit really nicely into the context of quantitative genetics. Um, it's just interpreting what they what they actually mean. That's the more difficult part. OK, um, so this next part is really came from uh, a single paper I was uh, very influenced by. Um, Dr. Turner Hassong, Sarah, is a great friend and really an amazing scientist. 
And her paper, an automated image analysis pipeline enables genetic studies of shoot and root morphology in carrots, um, is a really cool paper. And so they took this approach that I find very, um, I want to call it wise, um, but it's it's interesting. I, and I was really inspired by it. Um, and so the idea is we're going to take our binary image. So we're back to our images. We're going to take our binary image and we're going to sum um, the number of pixels in that image in a row wise fashion, um, how many pixels are associated with the object. So because they're binary, you can literally take the sum of um, the number of, of pixels that are black or the number of pixels that are white. And that's basically the value for a single image. Um, so each image, because I flatten or not flattened these, but I resize them to be 100 by 100 instead of 1000 by 1000, just to decrease the amount of space that this is going to take and the amount of time that it's going to take to analyze. Um, um, let's see. So here we have this function load and resize that that I wrote, which is basically just using um, stuff from image R um, to resize all the images, put this in an LApply function. LF is the list of files from earlier. And so we're loading and resizing these images, um, all of them at the same time. And then we're transforming them into a matrix. Um, so now we have a matrix that is uh, 6,874 rows by 100 columns. Um, and so these, oh, no, 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 that's not what this is doing here. This is just basically stacking them together. So now I have a list of, um, of images. So it's a list, each, Im each image in this list is 100 by 100. Um, it's the next step. I was a step ahead of myself, I think, or not. Oh. Well, I apologize. The code is in the um, R markdown. And so I'll pop over here to R. And let's see if I can get land on this. So, oh, include equals false. That was wrong. My, my apologies again. Um, let me make this larger. So there's our structure from earlier. Um, uh Mitch, I think you should increase a bit the size of the text. Um, yes, yes, I will. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so this is the code um, to actually do this. So again, V biomass and H biomass in that first top part is just setting up a matrix that is going to be a hundred um, values long, um, and be able to store all of our um, images. So each image has 100 values. Each one of those values is the sum of pixels associated with the object. Um, so that's how we're doing this. We I also did this in a different way where um, instead of just looking at the row sums, I also did the column sums. So this is sort of the variability in biomass as it moves from the top of the fruit to the bottom of the fruit and the variability in the number of pixels associated with that object as you move from the left-hand side of the fruit to the right-hand side of the fruit. Um, and then independently, we do um, principal components on each one of these. Uh, if you haven't caught on, um, lots and lots of principal components. And then we bind these together, export this as a data frame. And now this is where, for some reason, I, I don't know why, well, actually, I don't know why I included include false in that flag. Um, I shouldn't have done that, and I apologize. Um, but now we can make some figures. And so I actually don't like the way they look because they're quite short. Um, so I'm going to come in here and just try to plot uh, just one of these. Hmm. Let's see. Oh, never mind. I don't know why that's not working, but here we go. Um, so I'm basically look at, this is the information that we're getting. So this is the mean um, shape or the mean biomass as we move from uh, zero, which is basically the top of the fruit to 100, which is the bottom of the fruit. And if we change this and modify this to be, you know, minus 1.5 standard deviations from that mean um, in this first principal component um, of the, I think it's the horizontal biomass. 
Oh, vertical biomass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, of course, makes sense. The height, vertical, of course. Um, and then over here, it's the opposite, where you're adding um, standard deviation of this principal component to the mean shape. Um, so you can see how these start to impact the where the density of pixels are on this on these fruit, and can we use this information to reconstruct things? Um, so Sarah had much nicer visualizations than I had um, in her paper, and I highly suggest going to look at them to get an intuition for what this is doing. Um, one of the challenges with this analysis is that because we're just taking the row sum, we have no idea. Um, how those align together. So you sort of have this assumption of, of uh, symmetry um, down the center of the fruit, which probably isn't um, probably isn't right, um, but it's probably not too far off. And I think that especially with carrots and strawberries, um, you know, apples, pears, and other things too, it's probably pretty close to true, um, at least a reasonably close. So the idea is you could stack um, this image, this histogram next to it going the other direction, and that would sort of be the shape of the fruit or the predicted shape of the fruit. Um, and there are more figures because we do this for the other set of um, principal components, so the horizontal um, biomass, which again is if we are in the width and we're going from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, where is the biomass distributed? And so there is some lobiness in this uh, to begin with, um, and it sort of flattens out a little bit, and then we get more. So this is again associated with um, objects that are are thinner and longer and and wider and sort of more like squares. And we can look at them, interpret them. Again, I really suggest looking at Sarah's paper that I linked in the text here. Um, to try to understand this um, and to interpret it and sort of get a better uh, sense of feel, I guess. And that leads us perfectly to, perfectly, that leads us to the next thing, which is you know one of the last extractions of quantitative features that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, it is the last one. And <clears throat> after you've done all of this stuff, um, elliptical FOIA analysis, Procrustes analysis, these um, biomass profiles, it just kind of makes sense to do principal components on every pixel. And so that was the idea, is I'm gonna take all of my information that I have here in this 100 by 100 um, image, I'm going to flatten it, flatten it, so now I have a 10,000 element vector where the first row of information is the first row of pixels are the first 100 elements, the second row are the second 100, so on and so forth. And all of my objects are stacked together. So this matrix is 6,874 elements wide or uh, long and 10,000 elements wide. And we're gonna do PCA on it. Um, scrolling, scrolling. So I had the, um, transpose the matrix so that it's the right dimensions. Uh, one of the challenges with um, principal components, of course, is that if you have um, one dimension that's longer than the other, you can only get non-zero elements that, or principal components that are non-zero up to the smallest dimension. So in this case, there are 10,000 variables, but I only have enough information to have 6,874 uh, principal components. but I don't want to interpret 6,874 of anything, um, so that doesn't really matter in the, at the end of at the end of all this. Um, and then this takes a really long time to run. Um, you know, it's like 15 to 20 minutes. So I guess it's not a really long time, but if you're sitting there on your local computer and you do this on a single core and you're sitting there waiting for it, I suggest doing something else uh, during that time because it doesn't just run like that. But that's also not too surprising. Um, the other thing that you can do um, to help speed this up a little bit is actually, as I talked about at the beginning, is remove pixels or remove uh, from these 10,000 elements, remove the ones that don't vary at all. So there are some 
columns in this that are 100% zero. And there are some that are 100% white or 100% one. So 100, either of the binary values. Um, and you could remove those. They have zero variance. It would allow you to scale your principal components or scale the data before doing PCA, which makes a lot of sense. And you know, you'd have basically the same amount of information. They don't provide anything because they don't vary. Um, but in reality, there's only 675 of those in this entire data set. And that's along edges where all of them don't really go into the corner of these images. And at the center where the center is always um, the object. So it's always has, it always has a zero value. Um, so it's really not that many that you lose. Um, so it's not gonna speed you up that, that much, um, but maybe it's more appropriate, you know, um, and we could again um, talk about that later if you want. So you have to set scale equals false if you run this like I did. Um, and then you give it your matrix of all these flattened images and you wait. And then we can look at, okay, how much variability or how much of the total phenotypic variance is explained? And this is nice because, you know, it's the classic thing to do after doing principal components is how many do you actually need to um, meet some predefined proportion? Um, so in this case, we have 22, 23, 24, 25, 6, or 7. We, oh, it's right, literally right there. Um, it takes about 27 of these or 28 to get us to 75% of the variance explained. Um, but I didn't really wanna handle um, 25 values um, or 28 values. And so I ended up using um, the number to get me to 70, which is quite a bit um, fewer, but not substantially fewer. And so the idea then is, okay, I have these quantitative variables that are derived from these pixel values um, using principal components. So they are uncorrelated with each other. Um, and can I use random forest regression or something along these lines to figure out which ones are the most important for predicting shape? Um, and what am I gonna predict? Am I gonna predict another quantitative variable or am I gonna predict a category? Um, and so I think hopefully it shows up nicely, um, but we can, plot all of these, or we can plot most of them. And so each one of these uh, looks like this. And so this is one function to make one plot. Um, basically, we're taking our, our principal components data, and we are doing a sweep of it, and then we are putting it into a level plot. And so level plot comes from the lattice package, which I think should be in the binder environment. Um, and then if it showed up nicely here, we'll take a peek. It sure didn't. Look at that. Wow. Okay, coming back over here. Let's see if this works. Hmm. My mouse seemed to have, there we go. Let's just look at plot one, shall we? So they're upside down. Um, but plot one is basically the, uh, I think it's 1.5 standard deviations in the negative direction from the mean shape. And so basically what we're doing from this is we're painting pictures of strawberries. Um, and so we could take the principal components that explain the largest proportions of variance. We could put them into a multivariable genomic prediction model, and we could literally predict um, the mean shape by putting all of these things together. Um, so we could take genetic information at the conceptual level and paint a picture of a strawberry. And that's sort of the, the dream, I guess, of <laughs> the good stuff. Um, so let's look at a couple more of these um, just for fun. My mouse is lagging. Is that... Uh, I don't know what that is. Weird. Okay, well, there's another one. And again, I'm not sure why these are upside down. It seems like the mean shape plot just doesn't look right. Um, as you make, as you get to these smaller um, or 
because they're the higher principal components, one, two, three, four, five, and 10, whatever. Um, the variance that they're explaining is becomes quite minute and quite strange. Um, and because it's independent um, of all the other ones, you can actually get completely unrealistic things um, popping out of these. And so I'm not saying that this like kind of weird lobed shoulder thing is unreal, but it's probably more likely to exist in context of some other value uh, from uh, some other principal component. So just not by itself. Um, let's see if there's a, yeah. So this is one of those examples where this principal component seems to be adding wings to your data. And this is part partly the reason, uh, um, partly because of the way that I filtered and actually printed the object where I just wanted things that were um, very close to being black to be black in these images. And so really there's some sort of gray shading going on in here, but really it's, again, it's accentuating some sort of information that's primarily on the side and not inside of the, the shape. So you actually get these impossibilities, which is kind of funny. Um, and so adding these together actually does provide realistic information where the one we just looked at with the sort of square jutting out of it, you know, and this might be more close or closer to something that is biologically relevant or actually observable. Um, so I'm not, um, I guess there's a problem with plot M. I'm not gonna really worry about that though. So from what I just showed you, um, oops, um, elliptical FOIA analysis, generalized procrustes analysis with a structural equation model flare. Um, we did biomass profiles in two directions and we've done um, principal components or eigen decomposition on images. So we have quantitative features that are coming directly from these images. Um, theoretically, the same data that you use for um, PCA could be put into an autoencoder. Um, and there is a couple of nice ones that you know are wrapped in R packages. Um, they take longer than the principal components model I found. And I had a couple examples where they just kept crashing my computer. Um, but of course I'm trying to run them in R on a single core and it's just not optimal. Um, but I think that that's uh, an approach that I definitely wanna go in with this um, work. And it again is inspired by Joe Gage and uh, Joseph Gage and, and Jordan Ubbins um, and others um, who are working in this space. Um, so yeah, we have these quantitative features. We can look at what they mean. We can plot figures. We can start to intu intuit these. But how do you how do you market the idea of this has an eigenfruit PC one value of negative one hundred? How do you do? What do you do with that? Well, I mean, you do it by showing them a picture of what that fruit might look like that has that value, or the range of fruit that are in that value, um, and say, is this something that you like? Um, or you can use these to predict clusters or um, categories. And categories are really easy. People are really good at understanding categorical variables and what they mean and how they relate to each other. Or at least we're good at imposing some sort of relationship between variables. And so the next thing that I'm gonna show you really came out of my personal laziness. Um, I, had, I already had 6,874 images of strawberries and I wanted to have a categorization scheme for them. There are several things that are have been proposed in strawberry literature that sort of disagree with each other. The number of categories, the um, what those categories mean and this kind of thing. And so I wanted to avoid going down that rabbit hole and I wanted to avoid um, putting my personal opinion about the data into it. Because I know that as I as I work and as I'm, you know, I started categorizing some of these and I was doing a, just a really lazy job. I was so upset, I was so frustrated doing it that I know that the scores that I were giving probably weren't gonna be reliable. They're not repeatable, they're just my score. So like, okay, I have to have, you know, five other people do this. Maybe I'll use MTurks or something like that. But it's like, how many, then how many do I do? Like, what do I call these even, you know, do I, give them really, really specific details, like that seems like a really bad idea because there's so much variability. You know, in reality, in my in my mind at least, 
shape is continuous. Shape isn't categorical, but we're using the category. We want to use the category to try to make sense of this continuum, to try to discretize the continuum so that we can understand it simply and talk about it simply. So, I mean, even I've been thinking about this for you know two years, and I still have a really hard time talking about you know eigenfruit, <laughs> this kind of thing, um, outside of the context of here's picture one and here's picture two. So we're taking the same data that we just played with um, for the eigenfruit, and we're going to do k-means clustering on it. Um, k-means clustering is easy. I would say in R, it's easy to do. Um, there are challenges with it, of course, you know, as with all things, um, you have to decide how many categories there are. You have to tell it, you know, this is how many categories I want. And then the machine will find them. So if you say, you know, if you have 100 images uh, or 100 data points and you say, I have 90, I think there are 99 categories, it will find 99 categories. It won't tell you that, oh, actually, there are two. But you happen to have, you know, because you were telling it that, that's what it's going to find. And so you have the opportunity to find one to the number of data points minus one um, different categories. And you need to find a balance between um, condensing them all into one category and pushing them all out towards their own unique categories. And so with strawberry shape, I think the largest that I had seen in the literature was 11. And I got thinking, you know, if I were to do this in real life, if I was going to be, you know, in the field or in a head house somewhere looking at strawberry fruits and categorizing them in real time, how many would I want? How many categories would I want? And do I think that I would be able to reliably do 11? And I just, I just don't think that I would be able to do that very accurately. Personally, I'm sure there are people out there that, that act accurately can can do that accurately uh, but i don't think i'm one of them and so i maximized k to be 10 so i allowed k to be 2 through 10 number of clusters and i'm sure i could have found a more elegant way to do this but i just you know hard coded it fit 1 or fit 2 is 2 centers fit 3 is 3 centers so on and so forth um, this chunk of code extracts the centroid or the center, which is basically the average shape associated with um, that um, cluster. So in fit two, there are two centers. And so we can look at what those average shapes look like. Um, in my paper, I had done some cross-validation um, looking at the AIC, BIC, R squared, and um, the within group sons of squares to try to get an idea of overfit, you know, where and when is this happening? How extreme is it? Blah, blah, blah. And ended up arriving that there are four really distinct categories um, of fruit shape from that cross validation approach, um, which I don't have here, but the code is on GitHub as well. So you could go and grab that um, if you wanted to. And of course, they're upside down, these images. But if we're Again, we have we set k equal to four, and so this is what cluster one looks like. Um, let me see if they're printing here in a way that. Oh yeah, great. Um, so this is what one of these clusters look like. This is what the uh, average shape in that cluster is, and so this is the category. Um, so it's sort of this, you know, aspect ratio close to one. Um, kind of blocky, kind of murky, kind of square. We can look at this, you know, these other ones. And this one is, you know, aspect ratio is is less than one, so it's shorter than it is wide. And it's very rounded. So you have this, you know, horizontal ellipsoid. Um, this last one is basically your sort of standard um, strawberry shape. I think if people were to draw strawberries, they'd likely draw something that existed within this category. And then finally you have this sort of um, aspect ratio greater than one um, class um, where it's much, it's elongated relative to the other ones. Um, and some of these are, you know, again, we're only dealing with shapes, so we don't know how big these are. We don't know what, uh, how long exactly, but we can tell that it at least is longer than it is wide. Okay, popping back. And these are all going to be yep, upside down. There's that one. 
And so then we can determine the best number of clusters again using AIC, BIC, R squared, or uh, the within group sums of squares. And so basically the within group sums of squares is how much of the um, variability exists within clusters relative to the total amount of variability. And so as you increase the number of categories, this value always decreases. Um, it has to decrease. Um, and same thing with R squared, the more categories you add, the R squared is always going to get higher. You're always going to do a better job of fitting the data when you have an equal number of categories to the number of data points, but that's just not realistic. And so AIC and BIC um, are more appropriate where they also decrease, um, but because of the panelization, they can at the end end up increasing, which is very indicative of overfit. Uh, so with the other ones we're looking for, it's the same thing with the scree plot in principal components, where you're looking for an elbow. So if you think about just like hanging your elbow at sort of a right angle, the the category that, I know this is very abstract, but the, the cluster that exists at right here where things sort of flatten off is the preferred um, number of variables to use. So it's either the preferred number of principal components or in this case, the preferred number of categories. And so this function, um, this is how you extract the within group sums of squares. I don't actually have the code in here to do R squared, but I'm pretty sure it's on the GitHub. Um, again, here's a function to calculate AIC and to calculate BIC from the same stuff. And then we can run this on each one of our fit objects. So fit two through 10 uh, for both of these. And then we can plot them. And I realized um, like earlier today that I forgot to label um, these properly. And so this first one is the within group sums of squares um, and the label is accurate. And so when we're looking at this, we have this really sort of smooth slope. So it's not really very informative, um, which is sad. You'd hope that it'd be a little bit more informative maybe. And we actually have the same thing with AIC. So you can tell it's AIC because of because of this, because of the variable that's in the plot. But with the BIC, we do see this very clear elbow where it, between you know four and five, there is your clear elbow. And then around seven, it actually starts to turn around where that's your evidence that you're overfit. Um, and so when you do this in a cross-validation scheme, or when I did this in a cross-validation scheme, it became very clear that four was the right number of categories um, using an 80-20 um, train test split, or I guess cross-validation kind of approach. So basically I took 80% of the data, calculated this, I did that, I think it was 20 times, and then looked, you know, in general, is there any overlap? And they match in almost all of the, the folds and so it just was like, okay, that's very clear to me. And four categories feels really good um, to look at. And that's what we showed you earlier. Um, in R, it's very clear and the groups are very distinct from each other. And so as you get to these higher levels of categories and you're looking at the clusters, you can actually tell that, oh, these are very, very similar to each other. And so the odds of them actually being unique items is probably low. Um, so the final thing that I'm going to talk about, and I see that I'm pushing sort of, you know, 12 minutes from the deadline, um, is the principal progression of K clusters. And so this was, this was another idea where I have these categories and I want to order them. I want to put them on an ordinal scale. Nominal is challenging to deal with in quantitative genetics. I actually don't know if I've seen any papers that really analyze nominal traits. So that's like, you know, horse color, like the color of um, like, uh, or the type of patterning on a cow or something like that would be a, a nominal character where you don't know necessarily the uh, relationship between these things or the relationship is not um, evenly spaced as you would assume with an ordinal character. And so the idea is, can I use the information that I have in front of me to order these to, you know, with relationship to each other? And so I have Again, clusters for k equals two, three, four, five, six through 10. And I'm basically gonna look at the proportion of 
each cluster at k equals five and which how many of those came from any other cluster at k equals from k equals four so it's basically you know a tree splitting approach so as you're at k2 some of those both those clusters have to split in order to get to k equals three some of them might split more than others and some of them might split less than others um, to get to k equals three but they're splitting regardless so you don't have equal membership in any one category throughout the whole thing. So that was the idea. Um, and so basically what this needs is a data frame that has K2 through K10 um, as your variables. And then this bit of code will just do this for you. Um, so the idea is we have um, a proportion of, of membership basically from in a focal category, a focal cluster to all of the preceding clusters. And we take the covariance of this and we do principal components on it. Um, so the nice thing about principal components is that you have a organization. And so we look at the principal component one and the values um, that are in that eigenvector. So the, the values that are there in that, that this is unclear, I think, um, but the values in the eigenvector and we sort them. And so that sorting then gives us a relationship between the three clusters or four clusters that we're interested in. And so I'll show you the example and I hope that it makes a little bit more sense than what I just said. Um, so to do this, the, the visualization that I, I wanted to take is really comparing the hierarchical sort of clustering approach to um, what, what we're showing. And so all of these are just gonna plot a um, an object from H plus, which is basically taking the distance between things um, and clustering that. And we've already looked at that already a little bit. Um, and then we're also plotting the principal component um, progression on a different plot. And I think that it probably the visualization looks bad and it does. So I'm gonna come to here, scroll down, zoom in, and now it's a little bit better. Um, so let's just take um, K3 for now. We have no, cluster two, cluster one, and cluster three. And we look at the um, principal progression order, and we have one, three, and two. And so three and one are clearly closer to each other than they are to two, which is exactly what the hierarchy says too. These exist on two different branches. V1 and V3 have a the most recent common ancestor, for lack of a better term, um, <clears throat> with each other than they do with um, variable two or category two. But the, the thing about the hierarchy is that there is no order imposed there. You just know that V1 and V3 are closer to each other than they are to V2. And so each one of these branches, um, so for instance, V1 and V3, you can rotate that. And you can rotate that, and if you do, all of a sudden you have v1 v3 v2 and so you're reflecting the same amount of information and the same clarity of information but you're imposing this rotation where you're fixing the rotation of these branches um and so i you know suggest going forward and, and looking at some of these and playing around with that rotation around these branching points um, these vertical bars and asking yourself do, can i get this to match and so when we look at k4 we have a pretty clear separation between uh, V2, V1, V3, and V4. And we can see that we have, you know, this one actually matches perfectly, which is nice, um, but we have V1 and V2 close to each other, closer to each other than V3 and V4, and V3 and V4 closer to each other than they are to the other two. Um, <clears throat> and when we come down in here, we can actually see that to K5, V2 and V4 are basically nested right on top of each other. And so already we can see that, oh, you know, these are collapsing. So these clusters are effectively the same, is what this is telling me. And that matches the, there are only four unique clusters. And so again, the rotational thing, if you rotate around this branch, V1 is gonna be way on the outside. You're gonna have two and four together on the inside. And then if you rotate this one, you have five and then three. Um, so the rotational thing is kind of weird, um, but plotting it like this makes a lot of sense. So this is my principal progression through my clusters. And so my clusters go from you know, two, one, three, and four. And if you have the 
clusters, the images of the centers, you can actually look, okay, does this make sense? And if we pop back to this slide, um, this is with five, so it's not perfect. Um, but we can see that this ordering actually does make a lot of sense. You know, it goes from this elongated and um, narrow type of fruit um, to something that where the shoulders are expanding, the shoulders are still expanding, and now the base is expanding to it's all sort of, you know, elongating outward. So you have sort of a the top, the bottom, and then out. Um, and so that actually makes quite a bit of sense. And as I said previously, maps to what other people have looked at as well. Um, and what other people have said is the order by eye. Um, so I've already talked a little bit about future directions. I think that there's more space for um, these sparse factor type models. I think there's more space for auto encoders and these kinds of things where you're learning different types of features with different levels of complexities. And you know, really getting into can we paint pictures of fruit or leaves or whatever using just genomic information or genetic information um, in prediction algorithms. And so, I'm going to conclude there. There's some stuff that I've written here that might be inspirational or, or might not um, for you to check out. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I know we're close to that being out of time, but I'm happy to answer. I think you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think so far there have been no question. I think because probably there is so much to uh, process. Um, so, uh, but any anyhow, like the code and uh, the the YouTube video will be there. Um, so also the binder link. So if anyone. I guess people also go back and watch again and redo the code. Um, this also happened with Philippe. And so, uh, but of course, if you have any question, you can contact Mitch. Um, at its private yes, email please do. Um, yeah, it was like uh, Twitter of, or email or whatever you want, whatever is easier. Well, um, there is also the Slack channel that we built. And I think you can also join that. Um, oh yeah, I'll join so, that, and then so like the people that want to contact you, um, they can do it directly. Um, yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, so um, thank you, Mitch, for this uh, very it's it's kind of very tough uh, uh, topic, but you did very a great job. Um, and I think the, I guess, the last thing I want to say, which is which is linked to what you were just saying, the the code is not the hard part. And if you are, if you're, if you have an idea, um, at least in this space, a lot of the code is there in base R. It's there in in wrapped mm -hmm. functions that are really easy to use. And so it's really about, you know, just does this make sense for your data? Yeah, I think like, uh, well, first of all, machine learning is kind of difficult if you are starting to with, um, but it's good that he, I think you gave like a, an idea of what like it's the process to uh, kind of understand what, which kind of tool to use. And so it's like a building process. And I think that's important for people that want to start to use machine learning. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, so that's great. I think we are short of time. So I think I'm gonna just give like the, I'm gonna conclude this session and I'm gonna give like you, so thank Mitch too for, for this talk. Um, so I'm just gonna conclude with, um, by sharing the, um, uh, by sharing like the, um, the last slide, the slide advertising, I think my, well, I guess my uh, computer start working. <laughs> uh, so what I'm gonna say is that, so next week at the same time, we are going to have um, still another talk. Um, this time will be, um, uh, the speaker will be um, Cheng Gong Miao. Uh, I cannot share the screen because I don't know why it stopped working. Um, and um, 
anyone, anyhow, like you can still register the same link where you registered for Mitch um, workshop. Um, but of course, you can follow us on our um, networks and social media, and we will provide all the information. So 